Welcome to another episode of Artist Spotlight, the podcast. I'm your host, Mitch Stringer, and this week we have a terrific conversation with myself and Hollywood photographer Jeff Lipsky. Jeff is a Baltimore native and really one of the go-to people in Hollywood when magazines and other uh, movie studios are promoting work. He's photographed some of the biggest stars in all of Hollywood, everyone from Dwayne The Rock Johnson to Lady Gaga and Jeff Bridges, and really the list goes on and on, and I hope you really have uh, some time to sit back and relax and enjoy this conversation. Also, be sure to take a look at the Maryland Photography Alliance's website, that's mdphotoalliance.org, to catch up on all that's going on, lots happening in the coming weeks and months that you don't want to miss. So, in the meantime, relax and enjoy my chat with Jeff Lipsky. My very special guest today is Hollywood-based photographer Jeff Lipsky. Jeff, good to have you with us. Hi. Hey, Mitch. Well, <laughs> great to be here. Thanks for having me. So for those of you listening, Jeff uh, grew up in Baltimore and then really had kind of an interesting journey, which I guess if you if you come up with a autobiography I feel like you could almost read from fishing to photography in terms of some. <laughs> I've never heard that. That's good. I like it. <laughs> from I like it. The, the earliest times to, to transitioning into what you've become so, uh, so prolific at, you know, in, in looking at your work and kind of preparing for this conversation, um, I, I, I've, I don't know if I've uh, created a new term, but I find there's an elegant approachability to your work. And for me, what I mean by that is it looks like everybody is part of making the photograph. We're all in this together, but it's done, I think, at such a high level that it just it's very comfortable to see. It's not stilted looking. Would you kind of call that the, your style? Do you feel you have a style in, in the images you make? Well, so, uh, you know, I tell people sometimes you don't really know what your style is until somebody tells you what it is because you're so close to it um sometimes it takes someone else who's removed to kind of explain what your photographs are and and um sort of midway through my career people started saying oh your stuff is very organic approachable you know th some things that you said so um yeah that's sort of how I look at my work now and then when I take photographs I sort of feel that way I sort of try to take that approach of like purposely trying to make them approachable and organic and you know but with a, with a finesse a you know like a, I call it a high production value right where you know if you're if you get a location if you're paying ten thousand dollars for a location you should see it a little bit you know get a but not push not in your face, but just subtle enough that we know we're in a we're in a place that's um you want to be there. That's sort yeah. of what I do. Yeah, and, and you and I, when we had our our pre uh, interview phone call, we talked about some of the the photographers like Ouija and others that we kind of oh uh, Ouija, yeah, kind of appreciate. You know, when I of course I'm I'm too uh, young to know this. We both are, but back in the day, there was this Hollywood studio system where actors and actresses, you kind of signed a contract and were assigned to whatever project was as needed. And with that, there was sort of a classic Hollywood headshot. They were, of course, typically all black and white. They were kind of lit more or less the same, very sort of stoic and maybe sort of a an icy glamour, if you will. Whereas yours, as I use that, that term, very approachable, do you think that there has been a shift between putting uh, actors and actresses kind of on this pedestal to more now making them like everyday people, approachable, mm -hmm. at where uh, the audience can kind of relate to them as an individual as much as an actor or actress in the role mm -hmm. they're playing? Yeah, ultimately, I think that's what people want. But, um, I mean, again, they are still celebrities, right? Um even though, you know, there was a large shift right when I first started shooting, there was a big shift from putting, um, you know, I didn't start off as a celebrity photographer. I thought I was going to shoot fashion. And a lot of the fashion magazines were using models and, you know, they weren't using celebrities. And there was a shift towards, you know, more and more celebrities were being shot. 
not just for celebrity type magazines like Premier or um, you know Entertainment Weekly or People Magazine, Vanity Fair, but they were being shot for you know the cover of Vogue, GQ, um, you know the other fashion magazines, and so it's sort of for me that was like I got pushed into that, but at the same time I was like, well, I like to keep things. I you know you shoot who you are. You know I want people to be approachable. I don't like to put people on a pedestal you know, shoot them for who they are. And, um, you know, in my world, sometimes I have to shoot people in character, which I, is fun. But, um, you know, my whole set is based around making people feel relaxed so I can let their guard down so that they can, you know, be not be so posed, not be so um, icy, as you put it. Yeah, you um, know, there, and in in celebrity photography and of course you know you know almost if not all there is to know about this you have those artists who are taking part in uh really a promotional junket where they spend a few minutes either with a writer or a photographer to mm -hmm. create that mm -hmm. image and then maybe it's in a hotel room and then you move to the next uh, yeah. media outlet the next the next the next then there is where uh that star is brought in for as many hours or a day as it may take to get oh, the yeah. images that the studio wants. And I think probably for those who are listening, they may not have a real good handle on how those two different scenarios differ. So maybe if you can kind of, you know, okay. pull back the veil to give somebody an idea of what one is versus the other and what you can really do with those differences. Yeah. Well, Mitch, I love that you kind of know that's a difference. Some people don't see that. They just think, Oh, you know, you can, uh, you know, there are two types of photography in the world that I shoot in this, in the celebrity, you know, the notable people thing. There's the um, the three types. There's like the paparazzi, you know, red carpet type scenario. There's the um, step up to the, the mark line on the seamless and let me take your picture scenario where you have them for a couple minutes. And then there is the um, this, an entertainment. There's the uh, advertising editorial approach where... Um, you're shooting them for a cover of a magazine or for a story in a magazine, and that requires um, it's all planned, whereas the other ones aren't necessarily planned. Sometimes the backstage step up to the to mark, let me take your picture, that's planned because there's logistics involved. <clears throat> and I've done that on a, on a, I feel like a pretty high level where um, the Academy hires me, <clears throat> excuse me, to do these the portraits of the of the winners when they win an Oscar. And in that case, it takes me weeks to do the build. And, you know, I know the footprint, we build a set, the lighting scenario is done, the props are brought in, you know, a week before. And then when they win an Oscar, they're, I'm the first person they come to, they spend five minutes with me, I have to calm them down, grab their Oscar, give them a glass of champagne, and then I take their picture before they're led out into the world. So that's something, a fun, unique scenario. I only have five minutes with them or less. You have to think quick and you have to get the poses down. And at the same time, you're trying to make it make it real, and you know, show their enthusiasm and show, you know, that moment that you know it's a time capsule. It's called the archival portrait, and you want that. You know, there's a lot of weight on it. <laughs> but um, when it comes down to an editorial or commercial thing, there's also weeks in the planning of where you want to shoot, what the clothing you want. You know, you're having full control. The clothing, if it's a if it's an actress, you know, who's doing the hair and who's doing the makeup what's the styling direction uh what time of, you know then you're like what time of day um you know what's the storyline what's is it is it a clothing story is it a story about them um is it just one page i mean i've spent eight hours on a photo shoot just for one photo with somebody um like vanity fair for sure you spend you know you get to, sometimes you get them all day to do one photo one like well you know spread opening spread photo which is the best because then you're just you know there's nothing better than having the time the resources the budget to do what you want to do and create when you what you want to create in collaboration with the people that are hiring you it's never always whatever you want to do jeff it's <laughs> this is what it has to tie to we're looking for this type of vibe what are your thoughts? How do you, how are you going to execute it? So they start with an, with a spark of what they want. And then it's your job to, to steer the ship in your direction so that you can take the best photos possible. So 
it's hard to do both. It's hard to be backstage taking that quick photo of somebody. You have to think fast and you have to get a great photo in a short period of time. But when you're shooting someone um, editorially, commercially, it's just a lot more. It's a lot more process involved and a lot more people involved. You know, sometimes you have 40 people on set for a photo. That that actually is a good lead into a question I have. So for the uninitiated, a person thinks, okay, so Jeff has been hired to photograph fill-in-the-blank person. Jeff shows up with a camera or two and says cheese. And, and yes, I, I'm highly simplifying this. And this beautiful he or she smiles. And then you have this terrific image. When in reality, uh, about how many people from your team, as compared to publicists, art directors, et cetera, are on the set to create an image right. that you've been hired to do. I just want to give someone a sense for the time and the scale that it takes. Oh, okay. Yeah. So just my team, not including hair, makeup, styling, PAs, location people, where the, you know, and then there's agency people or the magazine editors. That's a whole that and then publicists and whatever. Take that away. Just my team, I have, you know, usually it's depending upon the size of the job minimum three assistants that you work with all the time and then you have a digital tech who is in charge of all the digital assets um that's bare minimum of and you know of like taking a picture in the scale that you want to, that i want to do sure i can just take a picture by myself um with one camera with no one around me which is actually the ultimate if you can do that that's why COVID, i love covid why well, let me preface that <laughs> um some positive things that came out of covid was that our photo shoots were so simplified because the no one could come the publicists wouldn't come the photo directors wouldn't come wouldn't go you know no one was flown in and and to the point where i didn't have an assistance or a digitech and here i am i get to go knock on like and i remember i had to shoot henry winkler for something because he had his show uh, whatever the last show he's in with the Barry show with Barry, um, uh, knocking on his door and I'm like, hi, Henry. And I just, me and my camera and let's go take some pictures. And that to me is the ultimate. That's all you need is one to simplify it to one thing. And that's in essence who we are as photographers. But when the productions get bigger, the jobs are, um, you know, there's a lot of things riding on it. There's hundreds of thousands of dollars riding on an image or something like advertising wise, the teams get bigger and you know, there's more stuff. So it, it is daunting when you're taking a picture and you look over your shoulder and there's 30 people behind you and, and they're all looking at the, looking at the screen and they're all judging you for the image that's coming up. I was going to say, and you're tethered. Yeah, exactly. Oh so God. Oh yeah. Pull the plug. If I can pull, <laughs> I always like, I can't tell how many times I'm like, pull the plug, pull the plug, pull the plug. <laughs> um, yeah. So, you know, it's when you, worst. When you have a, an artist who knows that he or she is going to be with you for either half an hour, two hours a day, you know, they're there essentially by contract. So how do you move from they're there because, frankly, they, they need to be to mm -hmm. they're there, but you have created a rapport now? And so it's not so much, okay, what do you need me to do? Okay, I'm going to do it. I'm going to, I'm, I'm malleable. Mm -hmm. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, right. I'm working on this versus I'm kind of enjoying this. This, this guy is goal. easy to work with. How do you, how do you evolve that if you've never met that particular artist before? Yeah. Well, I'm going to give away all my secrets, right? Um, it, it can be as easy as, I'm um, having a really good production or a good producer where, you know, the, did the talent have to come far to get to you? You made it easy for them. Oh, we're, in fact, we're going to shoot down the street from where you live. Cause I know it's going to be easier. Um, I got a house on the beach, even though we're not, we don't need to shoot on the beach so that when we're shooting, we have a nice beach vibe and we're hanging out. We're um, playing good music, giving the time frame. If they know they have to be out by four o'clock, they give you a hard out, but you say, you know what? You're going to be out by two we're going to get this done because you know they're like wow so when a lot of these fact you know factors come into play and they having are having good food they're having a good time they realize that it's not that hard to do a photo shoot in the essence it really isn't hard to take a picture um you put their guard down like i remember i had to shoot john cusack who's famously just hates hates being photographed 
is the worst person and like he just it doesn't happen so every so many years he'll have to do a photo shoot and so um i would my, my one of my assistants had the best little house in venice like a little cottage with a great backyard and i would have the talent i would have like someone like john go to this cottage and in the backyard we had a bar we would have a barbecue going we would have a picnic table we would ha i would have that built around in the backyard like different wall scenarios and we just hang out and i would say oh let's walk over here let's take a picture over here and then we hang out and i had a drum set for the drums kick back listen to music ha have something to eat walk in the grass oh let's go over here so we made it like a casual outside hanging out experience but yet it was a photo shoot and sometimes you have to do that because most 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 people don't want their photo taken they really don't most people don't enjoy it and especially actors they're not, they're not used to looking at a into a lens you know they're taught not to look into the lens so um you know it's a little bit of a stretch for them sometimes just to get them relaxed and then the your name comes up for a photo shoot they're like oh yeah i remember wow we hung out in that backyard and we had that barbecue and I love the pictures. You know, this is, you have to take good pictures. The pictures have to be amazing. You know, that's a given. So, um, but you have every, if, if, if uh, you ever, everything is in place, you usually get the person that you know, wants to go back, come back and get their picture taken again by you. Hopefully, hopefully. Well, you know, and, and what you just explained uh, resonates with me. I've, I've heard you tell the story about uh, Lady Gaga who you were to photograph her as part mm -hmm. of the presentation. And she basically said, I'm paraphrasing, Jeff, can we spend a few extra minutes? I'd like some pictures for my family, you know, of that. Yeah, yes. And, and, and uh, when you have that moment, I would imagine, you know, whether you're, you know, at your level or somebody else's, you kind of have this moment like, I'm in. Now I yeah. can. Oh, yeah. Can, that can doesn't always happen. Can you that yeah. moment? Yeah. Yeah, oh my God, that was the moment. Because uh, it was one of the uh, Oscars, I don't know what year it was, when she won for um, A Star is Born. And everyone was looking for her. Like she was like she was the it person, imagine, backstage. And no one could find her. I have a, you know, there's people that I have to get. There, I, have, I have a runner coming and bringing me people after they win. But a lot of times they don't come directly. And everyone's looking for her. And she was the one person... I was hoping that would win, that I would get a chance to photograph her because I hadn't photographed her before. And I didn't know how long I would have with her. So when she walked in, she was so like, Jeff, she called me by my first name. So she's very professional. She did her homework, found out who I was. She's like, I just want to spend, could you spend some extra time with me right now? Because I want to have these photos forever and I want to be able to give them to my family. And if I have children one day. And uh, I'll never forget, my assistant looked at me and I looked at my assistant and we were like, Bingo. Like that was, that does not happen. I mean, still to this day, we talk about that moment. And so she slowed down the process. She let me spend time with her to get a, a great photo. You know, it, suddenly we weren't rushed. We could take her time. And that's all I wanted. You know, I mean, the one person I wanted to shoot that day and, she, you know, and, and she's giving me all this extra time, which is wonderful. So. Well, you know, in, in looking at uh, some of your photographs on uh, jefflipsky.com, which is, if, for those who have not gone, is it, it's a treasure trove. You can just go through page by page and, and just, just get sucked into, you know, the work that you've done. And uh, I really, really love the the website. You know, one, one of the questions I have is when you're shooting someone how is that different when you're shooting someone who is a celebrity for whatever reason of note versus mm -hmm. a similar person, but they themselves are a photographer, could be Jason Momoa, could be Brad Pitt, certainly could be mm -hmm. Jeff Bridges. How is that interaction knowing that that person certainly knows their way around a camera? Is is that different? That's the best. Yeah. Are, are you That's more the best. Like, what oh. you're doing more or, or how does that flow? I mean, you know, Jason has like a collection of he's a he's a man of all trades, but he, you know he has a Leica collection like you can't believe, you know. And I'm like, you know, vintage Leica, put it on. Where, you know, let's take some photos with the Leica. You know, right. you use it like Jeff Bridges, total analog photographer, is famous for the super wide. I shot Jeff with film. I brought up my film camera out. I can't I couldn't wait shooting film with Jeff. I shot him on large format. 
Oh my God. He was so excited. You know, he, we talked about the camera. He loved the process. He let me, I said, this is going to take 15 minutes. We're only going to take four frames, you know, to put the digital camera down. Let's take four beautiful four by five images. I even shot Polaroid because I have, I'm one of those Polaroid hoarders. So I collected Polaroid and film and all that. So on a special occasion, if they know they really appreciate it, I'll break out, I'll break out film. So I was working with Brad Pitt and he didn't give me much time and he was starting to get up and I'm like, I don't have it yet. And I had a Leica and knowing that he is a Leica aficionado, listen, Leica is like, a, I don't think you have to have a Leica, I have whatever, but there's a romance to it. Some people have that romance. I happen to have that romance with that camera. I love it. But I had a Leica around my side and he goes, you can shoot me with that camera. And he stayed for another for like 10 minutes so I could take more pictures of him with that camera. Is that so, the M6? That was the M6. It, and it was film. You know, people really appreciate that. And film's coming back, and I'm really happy. People, are, More people are shooting film now. Do you, I, I, I guess buy-in is the wrong word, maybe, but, you know, when, when you hear, and I'll stick with Leica for a minute, you hear people talk about the Leica look or any particular uh, brand's lens. I mean, yeah. you know, do you have certain lenses either focal lengths or attributes of lenses where those are sort of your go-tos for portraits or is it really all over the map what what type of lenses you're using yeah it depends on the camera right. so if i'm shooting a Hasselblad because i like the i like the the medium format format i like that i don't like I have a hard time shooting portraits on a 35 millimeter format it just doesn't feel right to me mm -hmm. um the, the Hasselblad is meant for the 50. Like, that's the best to me. It's one of the best pieces of glass. And it's a reason to shoot the camera because the 50 millimeter lens, it's like a 35 millimeter on a on an SLR. And it it's just so beautiful. Like, I shoot everything with it. Whereas when I um, shoot my Nikon, um, I do it because it's fast and easy. And I use a zoom. I'm, I use, people laugh at me, but I use a, um, a 24 to 120 it's not that big, 4.0, because why do I need it? I can go up an ISO. I don't, but what I gain is I'm fast. I don't have to change lenses. I can zoom in, zoom out. I'm taking a portrait. I like to go wide. I like to go long and I can just switch it up and no one can tell the difference. I think with, the, with my Nikon, I bet that one has like 40 covers of magazines and no one can tell. Sure. No one can tell that I shot with a zoom lens. Sure, if I'm like super low light and I need to get a 1.4, you know, yeah, I'll have to do it if I'm, you know, I'm I'm just bottoming out. But why not? I can't tell the difference. No one can tell the difference. Well, you know, you don't need fancy glass. I'm not into the in fact I like glass that's not so fancy, not so perfect. You know, I don't want it to be too sharp. So but we, we shouldn't hold out for the Holga cover anytime <laughs> soon. <laughs> yeah, I have a Holga. I got one on my table, I think. <laughs> oh, I do. I have one right there. You really? Okay. Okay. So, you know, with your with your work that you're doing now, do you have folks that you would consider to have been influences, either either yeah. motivation or literal influences in terms of their style for people who kind of came before you or even people who are out there now doing it? Yeah. I, I mean, I look, uh, obviously, the masters. Um and I'm highly influenced by all these great fashion photographers more so than anything else. But also I'm, I always, I keep current with who's, you know, what, who's shooting what right now. Like I'm up to tab. I am up on every person who's shooting what's hot. What's the, you know, cause there's always a, there's certain trends in photography. It's true. It's, it's important to stay true to who you are mm -hmm. and um, not try to change your style too much and try to fit on, fit in all the time but to stay true to who you are and then hope that people will hire you for your look, you know, instead of trying to chase a look. But I'm into the timeless people like Richard Avedon, timeless, Irving Penn, timeless. Um, then it's like current photographers, Koto Belofo, the time, um, Craig McDean, I mean, Nick Knight, like all these greats. And then the lifestyle commercial photographers, Peggy Sirota is like number one, usually. For me, she's the queen of lifestyle. Um, and also, I'm a huge fan of Norma Jean Roy. And Andy Libitz, obviously, she's it. I mean, 
people say things about her, but when she wants to throw down, she, no one can touch her. You know, sometimes she dials it in, but God, when she, when, you know, not everyone can take a good picture every single time, you know, mm. but uh, she can be, you no, know, I, I love her work. Well, so, She's somebody, probably number one for me. Somebody once told me a professional photographer said the difference between a pro and an amateur, the amateur can make a great picture every so often. A pro makes one just about every time because they know what it takes to make it. Exactly. And that's the hard thing about being a, uh, a commercial. I say commercial at a, you know, there's some different facets of photography, but um, I'm being paid to go take a picture, a great picture right now. Like I have to like, okay, today you got to take a great picture, right? Take a great picture, right? now and they want it to be beautiful sun soaked backlit you know with bokeh and it's raining or it's an overcast day and you're on the beach and you have to make that shot look like they want and that's what professional photographers do whereas they you know there was a trend when all the influencers started to shoot and a lot of the ad agencies got bit because yeah, on that perfect scenario, the perfect day, anyone can take an amazing picture. Anyone can take, oh my God, drop dead picture. It's when you have to do that over and over again. And that's what separates, you know, the influencer photographer who doesn't really know how to shoot a camera to the professional who has a team that's been through it many times that can, you know, they can get it done. So it's important yeah. to, you know. Yeah, I think there's, have there's, 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 such an evolution going on and, and i'm certainly not the one to uh come with this uh this opinion but with social media and with the mm -hmm. advent of um filters and with the improvement frankly our phones are so damn good even as, as yeah. a little camera i mean you're not going to do enlargements etc but for for snapshots it's it's essentially ended the point and shoot industry you know from, from camera standpoint you know point and shoot cameras people aren't buying them you slap a few filters on it and voila everyone at least in their mind is is richard avedon in their mind so right. you know and 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 only in their mind but you know with with that evolution or uh, De, de evolution, you know, as we know, a, a number of magazines that used to be are not anymore. So the business is so changing. sad. It's so sad. It, it so is. Sad. It, it is. It is. And, you know, as I look at it, um, not being in your side of the business, I think, well, yes, there are less magazines, but there are more media outlets than ever before. So mm -hmm. theoretically, the demand has never been higher a, a million fold than when there were more magazines, but that doesn't show itself in terms of, of work out there because a lot of those online magazines are just getting the least expensive shot of whatever star on yeah. the red carpet. And I think that, and, and I'm drawing this connection that you may or may not agree is there, but I see that the, that, that, Maybe one reason why NFTs have become a thing now as as people rightfully try to explore other avenues and other other avenues of opportunity. Yeah. I mean, are they a thing now? I feel like they've they had their like peak or I don't know. I you know everyone got there was such a rage for the NFT. You know, there's certain buzzes that are happening, you know. Obviously, it was NFT, and then it became AI. Oh my God, Mid Journey! Like, oh my God, we're all going to lose our jobs. And right, right. You know, I use Mid. I use that stuff when I make treatments, and you know, I use it as a tool. I like it. I don't think it's gonna. No, people still need to pay for creative creativity. You know, the people that that are creators. Um, oh, and and to to your always point, changing. when people were talking about these NFTs, and I thought so. Let, let me make sure I understand this. I, I don't actually have a <laughs> portrait uh, of whomever or, you know, that yeah. I really like and it's on my wall and it's, you know, 60 by 40 and it's in my living room. No, no. I, I own a fraction of a digital image. And I thought, how is that even a thing? I but, don't even know. But it it's definitely, you know, it's one of the latest things that kind of crops up. So as as the magazines as the number of magazines ha are less than they were now where do you see kind of 
things going for creatives that are image makers such as yourself? You know, are, are you are you trying to uh, you know explore other other avenues or or other ways so that those who are in a position of hiring yeah. say that guy's on to something. We like his vision. I mean, I know they do already because you've had great success. Right. But going forward, how do you sort of try to future proof or at least evolve the things you're doing? I mean, the most the, the the most natural evolution from a photographer is to is is, is into film. So, uh, all photographers should be working on moving images and being able to push into the more directing and having that in their repertoire because uh, more and more clients are expecting mixed media. So they want a photo shoot. And they also want a video shoot. And even though the video shoot will, you know, we'll just live on social or it's not going to run on air. We'll just use it for the website. It's still, you know, what happens to a still shoot, it gets pushed on the side and that becomes a little, the little baby. And then the video shoot production takes over, but you have to be able to do both. You have to have that skill set. And, and, you know, when a client asks me, oh, do you do video? I'm like, yes, I do. I'll send you my reel. I don't have it on my site, but I'll send you my reel. You know, just because so that, that can make or break whether or not you're getting hired or not on a photo shoot is, sure. is having that. But um, as far as from, you know, there was a time when um, you can make a good living. And that's what I all I wanted to do was to shoot editorial. I only wanted to shoot for magazines. I only wanted to, sh I wanted to be a cover shooter. I wanted to, because it's an outlet. It's a creative outlet. Yeah. Yes, you have certain restraints, but you get to be so creative and then you get to see your work, you know. Mm -hmm your peers get to see your work. You know, all I feel is like my mom goes to the supermarket and she gets to see it, but really it's, <laughs> you know, there's something about seeing your work in print that resonates with a lot of people. And that has gone away. I mean, there's hardly any magazines left. And so the shift for me personally, I went from shooting uh, for, you know, X amount of magazines a week or a month to, well, entertainment advertising where movie posters and television shows still need to advertise for bill they go on billboards they go on buses they go on uh, uh, bus stops so i've transitioned more into entertainment advertising and then commercial advertising whereas some people start out right away being i want to be a commercial photographer i didn't want to be a commercial photographer when i started out i just wanted to shoot fashion editorial it's you know which turned into celebrity editorial and now I am primarily most of my work is commercial advertising and entertainment advertising. So that was my transition. Well, when, to when, do that. You're, when you're doing a shoot, you know, my experience shooting commercially has been when you have as much, essentially as much time as you need that the shoot kind of evolves. Meaning for me, a lot of the imagery that I'm capturing in those first five minutes is, was not ultimately as, as good as it was, 30 minutes later, I, I feel like a shoot evolves, whether it's a rapport between yourself and and, and the, the talent, a comfort level, whatever you want to call it. Um, shooting the folks you do, do you see that same kind of evolution over? Oh, a, yeah. Minutes or an hour or three hours? Oh, yeah. Okay. All the time. In fact, you even say I even say that, you know. You know, first the first setup we're going to do is going to take a little bit longer, but we're trying to get used to each other. You know, I tell the person, the creative that's involved in charge or the creative, I'm like, listen, we're not going to get things right away. It's just going to, it's a little song and dance. We're going to, it's going to evolve. We like, this is the program. This is how it works. And then something will click and something will happen. And when we see that moment, we all see the moment, you know, and then we, 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 we get it. I've had many art directors behind me, you know, freaking out because it hasn't happened yet. And I'm always like, just we have plenty of time. It's going to happen. Don't worry. Stop looking at the monitor. It's <laughs> We're going to get it. It just takes time. It takes time. And it always comes through. It always happens. If you set yourself up for success, it always happens. Well, yeah. from, from having heard the story of your Courtney Love photo shoot, it, 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 it certainly sounded like an evolution, which, which led, leads me to the question, what's the longest from the time talent was supposed to arrive to a shoot oh, that they yeah. did arrive to a shoot. What would be the longest amount of time that you've waited wondering, is this actually going to happen today? That was Courtney. That was um, that, that like, you know, nine in the morning to midnight. Wow. Wow. <laughs> but yeah. 
yeah, but but uh, a, a unique image came from it. So I guess it's it's an old. Yeah, I got great well. images. Yeah, and it was early in my career, or had it been later in my career, I just would have left. Right. I would have said, okay, you know, no big deal. We'll, maybe it'll happen in the future, but uh, it was so early in my career, I had to have that photo shoot. It was like a big break because as a photographer, every time you get a, a break for in a magazine or a client, you can't, you have to hit it out of the park. And if you don't hit it out of the park, there's 40 other photographers that want that job. Sure. You have to get it. Like there's no, there is no bad photo shoot. If you don't get it, if you, when you, that was one, you get a great opportunity, your first opportunity to shoot for Vogue. I remember I had a, I had to like hit it out of the park. I had to be, bring my game, you know, or else it's done. Nothing's worse than that. When then you're not, you don't do a good job. You try, but you know, you can't always, it doesn't always happen. You just don't want it to be on that first job. If, if you were to create one of these time capsules, that would that would be representative of your career and in that time capsule you put a Hasselblad you put a fishing fly and you put an eight by ten of Daryl Hannah <laughs> right can, can you tell our listeners how those three elements really are in a way connected from your very beginnings all the way oh yeah the they're all connected yeah I mean well the Hasselblad's my first camera I bought myself um I'm thinking when about living, when, when, when you were in Telluride, Telluride and you yeah. met, met her. And I bought that camera in Telluride from Calumet wow. from the catalog, thinking I had to have a Hasselblad. I wanted to be a real photographer. And um, as a fly fishing guide, I had a great clientele and everything. And I was and a snowboard instructor. And I was friends with Daryl Hanna because I was her snowboard instructor. And then became good friends with her. And that turned into a you know, oh, Jeff, can you take my picture for something, you know, with my Hasselblad that I had no idea how to load. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I figured it out. I figured it out. But uh, on my first photo shoot, like uh, Sunday Times, London Sunday Times, wanted photos for, of Daryl. And she said, can you come with me to Santinez and take pictures of me with my horse, Jeremiah? And I just brought, I just remember I had my Hasselblad and I had a pocket full of film. I had one pocket filled with black and white and the other pocket filled with color 120 and just you know shot like 10 rolls of her with nothing else but her her horse her dirty t-shirt in a field <laughs> and i backlit it because i had no I had no idea what else to do and it was like they're my favorite photos of all time i think they're like i think they, I, don't, I don't know how they turned out so well i mean the exposure was right everything was perfect <laughs> And that helped that helped me with my career a little bit because I had that in my portfolio. Well, I'm sure yeah. great great pictures, but also hugely symbolic of really the sure. beginning. And so. still, hey, listen, I still not that long ago I had an assignment to go. A magazine asked me if I wanted to go fly fishing with Jimmy Kimmel in Montana for a cover of a magazine. I was like, yeah. So sometimes you know your passions, your worlds collide. Mm -hmm. You know that's my favorite. If I can you know, go snowboarding with Tony Hawk in Alaska or a picture, you know, an assignment or something. When things like that happen, that's the best. I love it. We're, I get to go to Telluride for a photo shoot. Love that's it. not the worst location. Not the worst location no. at all. No. You, know, you, you, bring, you bring up the lighting and that, that actually poses a question. You know, lighting can be, for amateurs, certainly can be daunting. Are you using mostly flash or mostly consistent light now, or uh, what, what do you have, do you have a, a preference among those two? Um, you know, whatever it takes to get the job done. Sure. But if I have an option, I am I am, and I've always kind of held this back, and I didn't want to let. Commercially, it's not really that good for me to say this, but I love it. I am a natural light. I love natural light. If I could shoot natural light only, I just, it's what appeals to me. I get inspired by it. And I'm not just talking like being outside with bright sunlight. You know, I could be on a second story of a house with a window and I'll throw a four by four mirror in the street and I'll bounce light in from the window into the window. Like I'll go to extreme lengths to, to throw and shape natural light. 
you know, uh, or ambient light. Mm -hmm. And I just love it. I love it. If I, if I have a choice, I'm in studio, I make sure that I'm in a studio when I'm lighting things, I'll have a whole grip truck of equipment. But if the natural light looks better, I'm going to take advantage of it. So a lot of times I'll be shooting a magazine for a magazine cover and I'm, I have a lit scenario, a lit set to put them up, to put somebody in and I'm firing away, but then I'll always have a natural light set. Oh, okay. Same outfit. Let's just walk over here. I have a grid cloth pressed against the window and the lights pouring in in a certain way. And I'll, and I'll look and I'll go, Oh, you know what? The natural light looks, it always looks better. Sometimes it, you know, not every, not every time, but it's nice to compare. Some people, it just feels more organic. That's what gives, I feel my work a little bit more organic feeling, but, um, but the natural light is definitely, you know, it takes three assistants with 12 by duvetines on the ground and silks in the air to make that natural light look the way that I want it to look. Sure. Sometimes you get lucky and it's like, oh, there's a window light. It's, that's it right there. It's perfect. You know, so being able to see that light, I think, is important as a photographer. As soon as you start seeing what good light is, that's that's when you start really um, taking it to the next level. It, it's funny how it does take, you know, multiple assistants and multiple uh, uh, pieces of, of equipment to to maximize that natural light, put that light where you want it. But but it is ultimately natural light that is is providing that. You know, with and you you touched on this a little bit earlier when the client wants a, a beautifully lit, it could be a, a sunset and this and that, but yet it's raining that day. What what mm -hmm. what's maybe I don't know if it would be the biggest challenge, but you know, as 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 a problem solver, which you know often you find yourself in that role, what, what are some of the biggest hurdles you had to overcome on a shoot where you thought this is not at all what we hoped it would be, but we're here and we've got to yeah, make you take it, you know, you you um um you just you know make lemonade from lemons i guess it's the same goes um obviously what you know to make to make beautiful sun you know i i had having a good budget i can get 20k hmis and have them all warmed up and i can have it behind the side i can create you can literally create sun hmm. anywhere with the right equipment um but and, and i was shooting an outside magazine a series of outside magazine covers uh, i think it was six covers with six athletes and i had um, shot in Malibu and it was one of those rare days in Malibu where it was complete socked in fog. I mean, it was foggy as it gets. And I started shooting. I'm like, okay, if it's going to be foggy, please stay foggy all day. Don't not give me fog halfway through. And then all of a sudden everything changes. That's what usually happens. And I shot the entire, um, I shot everyone in the fog. And so it created this, you know, super soft, feeling and every cover had the same everyone was this washed out white in the backgrounds but that has this like mist kind of a texture to it and it all turned out and the creative director you know recognized it too she's like let's go with it you know instead of bringing out the lights and trying to make it work because we weren't going to get a blue sky we weren't going to see anything we decided to work with the fog on the beach and everything turned out really well I know you've you've talked about when you have a shoot, you've got kind of your goals and objectives and you've got uh, the, the maybe the, the client's goals and objectives and maybe the artist's goals and objectives. And it's sort of a matter of uh, melding those to get every to get everyone what they want, so to speak. Are you are you trying to get. I guess, do you prioritize those? Is it wh whoever is actually paying for the shoot? We have to get their images mm -hmm. first and then we can get a little creative or is it more a matter of we need to get the client what they want, but it will definitely happen during the course of this overall shoot. Is um, there an to that? Yeah, I mean, everyone wants a collaborator. No, okay, no one wants to work with someone who doesn't collaborate. Okay. There's very few people out there that, say my way or the highway and there are a few photographers that way and they're they're they can they can get away with it but you have to be able to collaborate in order to get the you just have to so it's about steering the ship um probably tack in the direction that tactfully so you give them what they want you give yourself what you want and sometimes it's a three-way, three-way. Some sometimes it's the publicist of the celebrity that wants something in a celebrity shoot. It's a magazine that wants something, and then it's you want something. 
most importantly, though, you have to remember, you have to get, editorially speaking, commercially, I'm like, whatever you want, but let me, you give them what they want, and then you push it, and you go over what they want, and put your little spin on it, and hopefully they'll like it. So you give them what they want, and then you give your little spice. Mm -hmm. of, let me try, okay, you, we got that, but let me try this, you might like it, you know, and hopefully they run with it. Editorially, everyone wants something but it's most important the reason why you're shooting it is so that you can get something for yourself so if i come out of a photo shoot and i don't get anything for myself what's the point you know you're taking a portrait of someone if you don't get that image that you want to show or put in your portfolio you know you got to do we got to get something for yourself and you have to people want you to take pictures for what you want like hope i'm hoping that when someone hires me after they look at my work they're hiring me to get what my look and my look is what I want. You know, very rarely do you have an assignment where someone looks at your work and then they ask you to do something completely different. Sure. You know, so the goal is to give them your taste or what you like and they like it. They want it too. That's why they're hiring you. Other than, but you have to collaborate. Other than family members, do you have a photo you've made that you would consider to be your favorite? Other than photo, other than family members. Well, in other words, you know, we all love pictures of our kids, you yeah. know, that kind of thing. But from a professional perspective, have you made a particular picture where you think, of all the pictures I like and I really like, that's the one that is my favorite that I've made in my career? No, I mean, I have ones that evoke emotion in me from the you know from the moment me memories of you know how you shot it. Okay. All photographers become very attached. That's why it's hard for us to do our own editing. Or not when I say editing, I mean calling images and putting them in portfolios and showing work. You know, you, a lot of times you're, there's an image in your book and you want to keep it. And there's someone says, no, that's not a good image. But you're like, but I remember when I shot this, you know, I got, the, you know, there's like an emotional attachment. So we get, I personally get emotionally attached in some of the images I shoot. And I have, it's hard to let them go. So I'm, a, mine's, my opinion is very subjective. And what I like is my favorite image because it goes more than like, oh, that's a good image. There's a story behind it that I created that, you know, I put 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 something into. But I'm trying to think of an image that I really, um, I mean, I usually put them on my walls. But I don't what, know what? of anything that I really, I, if, I, if you look in front of me, you can't see. I have an inspiration wall. Okay. And also I have images of things that I've shot. And I have it so I can just glance up and it's sort of like a timeline of things that I've done. And I can just, that's why I'm like looking up to see some images. I don't even know. Well, you I know, think... what? you make you, you, when you make it, you'll say, damn it. That's the one Mitch asked me that this is the one, this is, like... I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's, there's assignments like my ESPN body issue cover. I'm really proud of, um, those are very, very, you know, certain monumental things in my career. I, I, you know, I appreciate some outside magazine covers. I really love. Well, and, uh, and I'll, my... I'll, I'll close, I'll close with this question, Jeff. So for those who are listening and they think, you know, I, I, I tell people or ask people to, you know, smile and take their picture. Um, but people look stiff when you do that. They might say, you know, what, what would be your advice to an amateur who, you know, just wants to take uh, whether we call it better or more yeah. natural looking, you know, pictures of people. Do, do you have any advice for them? Um, really, it's about communication with your subject. And a lot of times when you I tend when I shoot somebody, I've it's a learned skill how to communicate behind your camera. As soon as you put a camera up to your face, a people can't really hear you. You're sort of like, you know, you kind of hide behind it and it's hard to communicate to the subject matter. And the subjects are like, what is this person doing? You know, <laughs> I, so I'm always, I push myself to communicate. And I say, listen, we're taking your picture. We're going to start off kind of static and stiff, but that's why we have to start somewhere. You know, I want to, and I'm going to ask you to smile or I'm going to ask you to do this. It's just a placeholder. We're just starting somewhere. And when I'm, if I'm not saying anything, it's because I I'm, I like what I'm shooting, and we're just getting we're, I'm putting things in the in the camera. I, you know, I will give you direction, but it's just going to take some time. You know, I'm looking for the right moment. I'm looking for uh, the right angle and things like that. And I'm looking for inspiration, and then we'll I'll start giving you more direction. But if I'm not saying anything, it's okay. That means I like it. 
Yeah, that's um, great. So, I mean, whatever. I'm just saying, listen, I'm just blah, 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 blah. It's not, I'm just communicating. Um, and to me, the, the moments come with the in-between moments. So you're taking someone's picture, but it's the caught moment of when of what usually the the one that you like and a always listen to people around you or listen to your subject you never know um someone can whisper in your ear you know what the wall over there looks better the light's hitting it a certain way you might want to go over there so you know as a photographer don't be closed-minded be open-minded and listen to suggestions because when you're you're getting tunnel vision looking for that viewfinder and you don't see anything else that's going on but in that viewfinder they're you know, I like to listen to other people and I also won't shoot things that I don't want to shoot. So if I put someone against a, a background and I don't like what I see, I won't waste my time. I'll say, you know what? I don't like this. Let's go over there. Nope. I don't like that. Let's go over here. And your subject will appreciate you knowing that, you, you know, you're not wasting their time. And it puts more value when you do find something you like. They, they, they're like, oh, okay. Oh, this is good. He really likes this. So, you know, don't be afraid, you know, to move on if you don't like an image and keep an open mind of, you know, having people tell you, no, listen to other people. That, yeah. that helps for me. Yeah, that that's great advice. Sort of set the expectation like, yeah, it's going to start off a little, a little stiff, yeah. but we'll get there. We're yeah. not going to get it immediately. It just takes time. Yeah, yeah. That's all. That's great. Even let's say you only have 10 minutes. You still, we're not going to get it immediately. We're going to get it within those 10 minutes. You know, you have, you know, you're working within that time frame. That's great. I uh, again, I really appreciate you taking the time to join us. It's been uh, it's been great to chat. Oh no, God, you were great. I mean, great questions, like, <laughs> really good. I uh, appreciate it. You know, uh, just following you know the things that you're doing, and and uh, I, I would encourage people, like I mentioned earlier, to check out your your website. Uh, in addition to your website, are there any other social media places where people can pop in and see? Um, at, Jeff, I'm at, at Jeff Lipsky Lipsky on Instagram. Okay. My website, like I think, like everyone, I haven't updated it in a long time, and I'm pretty lazy about it. But um, Instagram, I sort of. It's a little more, it's a little more curated. I think it's a good insight to my photography. So I think Instagram's fun. It's more fun to go to. But my website's good. I mean, yeah, no, it is. It really is. It, it's it's pretty interactive, and it's got it's got a great variety. So I definitely encourage people to uh, to check out both Jeff's Instagram and website. A uh, lot of good in, uh, inspiration and motivation. It'll get you out there get you out there shooting maybe in a stream who knows there's no no lack of i can't wait i, I want to go fishing soon <laughs> all right time. Well, thank, thanks jeff we'll talk soon all right thank you thank you mitch yeah. take care i hope you enjoyed listening to my talk with jeff just a really terrific guy and so much experience so much knowledge and hopefully you can check out his website at jefflipsky.com for all of what he's got going on and get some photo inspiration along the way. If you'd like to see what I have happening, go to MitchStringerImages.com, my website. You can also go to Instagram, which is also Mitch Stringer Images, to see what I'm up to. That's probably the best place to see the latest and greatest and what's happening. And until next time, next episode of Artist Spotlight, the podcast, I wish you good light and happy shooting. We'll see you next time.